Metal Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers, and welcome to another episode of the Stuck in the Middle Podcast. I am your host, Jason Eck. And this week, we're doing a little bit of a stroll down memory lane, as I like to do from time to time. But before we get into that, just like to take a moment and, you know, give a little bit of a, a quick memorial to um, someone who was a legend in mostly film. You know, I, I guess he did some TV work. But I think depending on your age, you might know him from for some vastly different things. And it could go back to your memories of him in Rocky, Rocky 2, Rocky 3. Of course, I'm talking about Mr. Apollo Creed. Um, but also depending on your age, you might think of Predator. Or perhaps some comedies such as mm, uh, Happy Gilmore and even more recently, The Mandalorian and that whole series. Talking about, of course, Carl Weathers, who you know started out as a football player, and this was not uncommon, um, and it still continues to this day, uh, but really known as a football player in the you know, early to mid-70s, 1970, 1974, um, playing out of Long Beach College and then transferred to San Diego State, uh, was undrafted but ended up uh, catching on with the Oakland Raiders for one year and then went up to Canada uh, and played for the BC Lions from 1971 to 1973. Is that correct? Yeah, that looks right. But, of course, we first really get to know him when... um I mean, he did he did a number of movies. Just to look at this, you know, um, filmography, Magnum Force, Friday Foster, Bucktown, The Four Deuces. But then we really get to know him from Rocky, Close Encounters, The Third Kind. Um, let's see, from t- Force 10 from Navarone, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, um, all is Apollo Creed, of course, Rocky 4, Predator uh, as Colonel Al Dillon. Action Jackson, which was his, you know, first, you know, foray in the in the fully leading role uh, that really, I think, was the intent was to get a franchise out of it. Uh, Sergeant and later Lieutenant uh, Jericho Action Jackson. Uh, that was 1988. Didn't really have anything. Uh, did some, you know, TV, I guess, in between, but then really came back again in, a, in such a vastly different role, which I think is what's so interesting. So, you know, those earlier roles, so whether it's as Apollo, so Apollo was a a flashy fighter who came to respect Rocky and became not only a friend, but also a coach to Rocky Balboa, Um, you know, Lieutenant Dillon, is it Lieutenant Dillon, Colonel Dillon in Predator, you know, had that same kind of bravado, but he was meant to be like the guy from, from DC and a little bit of not a traitor, but he got them into this situation and kind of had to eat some crow, ultimately died a hero. Um, But then Happy Gilmore comes around and he's in this comedic role and and he's singing. I mean, it was just such a, 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 a 180 on what we've come to expect from him in, in these movies. And of course, as Chubbs, who also played a small part, kind of a, a cameo in Little Nicky. It did uh, Voices, uh, uh, Eight Crazy Nights, another Adam Sandler vehicle. So, I mean, he and Adam Sandler obviously ended up having a really nice rapport and relationship. Um, he was Combat Carl in Toy Story 4, which is just tremendous. Um, but then when you look, you know, later on, you know, he did guest shots on, you know, ER, on Psych. Um, continue to do voices for Toy Story. Um, let's see. Chicago PD, Law and Order, Magnum PI, 
And then, of course, Grief Karga from 2019 to 2023, uh, 2023 in The Mandalorian, of which he was also a director. But just, uh, I mean, what a career kind of encompasses so many things, like many in that. I, I feel like there was a much more commonly kind of seeing that football transition into actor, I think maybe more easily. I don't know. Trying to think who really has made that kind of jump recently. And there's none really jumping out at me. I mean, you can say guys like Terry Crews have done it, but who's really become a star in their own right post NFL career, at least not recently. I was expecting guys like Gronk would get into acting. And uh, of course, he was flirting with wrestling for a while. I mean, definitely wrestling has gotten a lot of these guys, but Carl Weathers, crazy to think he was 76 years old. He certainly didn't look it. Looks fantastic in The Mandalorian, probably looked, you know, 20 years younger than he really was. Maybe I'm pushing it, but at least 10 years younger than he was, but a legend and icon and uh, rest in peace to Carl Weathers. So this week's episode, I said at the start, kind of a a journey down memory lane, but we are talking about music and and we do this a lot in, in my house. And right now my oldest has been to a couple of concerts, but those concerts have all been Billy Joel because for whatever reason, he just loves Billy Joel and he has a really close friend. They both love Billy Joel. They've seen him solo at Madison Square Garden, and then saw him in a bill with Stevie Nicks. He's also a big Fleetwood Mac guy. I'm Fleetwood Mac, but Lindsey Buckingham, Christine McVie, he's all about Stevie Nicks. So Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks in a stadium. Pretty cool. And the stadium is like, I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes from his college. So that was just an awesome experience for him. But my other kids have different tastes of music, And I think part of it for me is that when I was a teenager, rock and roll music, in particular, it was kind of what's been known as the hair bands. And they were national touring acts and they were playing in, by and large, arenas and usually selling out arenas. So we're talking anywhere from you know, seven to 20,000 seaters and doing it regularly. And my kids really haven't had those experiences and I'm not real keen on coughing up a whole bunch of money and going to take, you know, at least one of my kids to go see Travis Scott, for example. I I would suck it up, but I'm going to do a whole episode just on on hip hop and I have another thing coming down the line. Um, I've done hip hop episodes before, but it's just kind of interesting how things have changed musically in the landscape. So that's really what I was thinking about. It was an embarrassment of riches if you were into rock music, and rock music was the predominant genre. Nowadays, concerts, a lot of them are, just like through streaming and things like that, it sometimes inflates figures, I think, as far as streams and sales Because a lot of artists that are doing seemingly these gangbuster businesses and have become really well known for the youth culture really aren't doing huge venues. There's really not that many that are doing these huge, huge venues. And of course, Taylor Swift is is beyond anyone at this point. Post Malone does, uh, you know, I I guess he does stadiums, but uh, large arenas, Travis Scott, Drake, um... You know, the, uh, a few of the country guys are able to do that, like your your Morgan Wallens, um, you know, those kind of things. And but they're all over the place from a genre perspective, not really locked into a particular thing. And you didn't have these kind of encircling in and out, like different opening acts. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about um, playing for the same headliners, but going to these arenas. There's only one show on here that I think is. I think there's only one theater on here, but it's just, a, it was an embarrassment of riches. So what I did was I went for my very first concert, which I've talked about before, and it went through the summer of 1991. Now, the reason that I did that is because in the fall of 1991, 
music essentially changed. We've talked about that on the on the show before, where we're talking about all these amazing records that all came out right in a row that shifted everything into the alternative rock place, the grunge place, kind of a return of punk. Like all those things started happening in 91. So this is also interesting to kind of see that like transition. And there's one concert in here that was kind of an early glimpse of how things were potentially going to be. So let's, uh, I'm going to take a sip of this good old Polar uh, Black Cherry Seltzer. Polar, sponsor me. Lord knows we go through enough of it in this house. All right. So my very first concert. So one of the things that is kind of a bummer is, you know, I've, I've, Moved a number of times, you know, I, I moved to different states, apartments, houses. I don't have certain things. So I don't have ticket stubs. I used to keep them. No idea where some of these are. I know where my very first one is. It's somewhere here in the house. And that's uh, January 23rd, 1988, the New Haven Coliseum, White Snake and Great White. Now, the reason I just mentioned the ticket stubs is that there are a few of these in here where I don't remember the opening act. Sometimes they're less important, but also I'm like, ah, oh, did I see this one? And did the archives of this venue, are they accurate? Because some of the things are kind of ringing a bell, but this is also 30, uh, almost 40 years ago. So, so, okay, not quite 40, but we're getting there. 35, Um so January 23rd, 1988, my very first concert, I went with Justin and Don, who were both on the show early on at the New Haven Coliseum, and I did not go pre prepared for what things were going to cost, first of all. Uh, I didn't know what a t-shirt was going to cost. I was really not prepared financially for even getting something to drink. So instead of getting a t-shirt, I got a great white headband, which bear in mind, at the time... We had mullets. You could you could put on the headband. It still looked pretty cool. And of course, Jack Russell from Great White would wear a headband. But this was on the floor. We had floor seats. I think Justin's dad got them for us. And immediately we get there and people start smoking pot and people are getting hammered. Women wearing the most outrageously skimpy things. And we're like in middle school. This is my first concert and then my first concert with just my buddies in our own seats. And we're in a whole different world now. Completely different world. And so Justin had been to many concerts. So had Don. I was the only one who was a noob. So the light show, the spectacle, the, 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 how loud it was, it was mind blowing. Now, Great White at the time was killing it. They had a song on the radio that was a big hit with Rock Me. They were doing covers of like Zeppelin and they came out and killed it. They were awesome, They but they were solid. Solid if unremarkable. Now Whitesnake, they came out with an absolute vengeance. Like they came out ready to kick ass. Now you had a whole lot of very talented Long tenured touring musicians, David Coverdale, you had Adrian Vandenberg, Vivian Campbell, uh, it was Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge. They were just hitting on all cylinders. White Snake, vocally, very, very, very difficult. At the time, David Coverdale, he's probably in his late 30s, early 40s, he had full voice, and it was just pedal to the metal for however long they played hour and a half, whatever. Now, I was less familiar with their older material, which they did do some of the stuff from, from earlier records, not just that, you know, White Snake 87 record. Here I go again and all those big hits. But yeah, it was a spectacle and it was loud and it it blew my little teenage mind. God, was I, let's see, how old was I? 14. I wasn't yet 14. I was 13 because it was in January. Yeah, I mean, Bro, kicked my ass. Absolutely kicked my ass. So then my next concert was just a few months later. And this time I went with uh, my friend Toby and Keith. 
So Toby and Keith, uh, April 8th, 1988 at the Hartford Civic Center. And it was David Lee Roth and Poison. And I got to tell you, um, I was always in the David Lee Roth camp with that whole Van Halen breakup, right? Well, I say breakup, Van Halen stayed together. I just mean like that whole split between, you know, uh, Van Halen and becoming Van Hagar, as they've they've been called. Um, I've come to really appreciate Sammy, but at the time, not at all. I really, I didn't dig it and I couldn't. So it was like, all right, Roth's got this killer band, you know, uh, Billy Sheen on bass, Greg Bissonette on drums, and Steve frickin' Vi on guitar. So if you're going to no longer have arguably the greatest rock and roll guitar player of all time, <coughs> excuse me, folks, um, of course, in Mr. Edward Van Halen, I mean, you, you get the next best guy. Now, Looking back at, at certain things, because uh, I know that right now, um, Sammy Hagar and some of his compadres, so Michael Anthony, um, and then who's playing drums? I think Jason Bonham, son of uh, John Bonham. They've decided that they're going to do kind of a tribute to Van Halen, Right. But they've gotten Joe Satriani to play guitar. Now, Joe Satriani is technically extremely gifted, like crazy bonkers guitar player. But I think if you wanted someone to really play Eddie stuff, I think he had to go with Nuno Betancourt from Extreme, um, which would have been interesting since Gary Sharon, of course, was briefly the lead singer for uh, Van Halen. But I got to tell you, David Lee Roth put on a hell of a show. Poison was there to make a name. Poison was there to say, we are on the scene. We are going to kick ass, take names, and we are ready to go. I mean, this was still, look what the cat dragged in. So their debut record just crushed like absolutely crushed and we're basically saying next time we see you, we're going to be the headliners. I mean, Dave had a great performance, great stage show. The band kicked ass, but poison was making it known. We are the next ones. And honestly, I didn't get to the the stadium show. Everyone said that poison was the best pure live performance of all the groups that performed. I mean, that was Joan Jett, Poison, Motley Crue, Def Leppard. Poison just kicking ass. Um, And it was no different back in 1988. It really wasn't. So I couldn't find any other concerts that I went to in 88. So this is where it's memory, I'm old, done too many drugs, like whatever. So the next thing when I was going through the archives is 1989. I don't have the date because they did a few shows around this time. And this was at the Hartford Civic Center. And I was super stoked to see both bands, but I really wanted to see the opening act because as a singer in bands, I wanted to see Sebastian Bach. So this was Bon Jovi and Skid Row. Now, I was given kind of a, a call one day from my aunt's boyfriend at the time, this guy, Tommy O. And Tommy O is a singer-songwriter for a bunch of bands in Connecticut. Um, He briefly was potentially going to be a member of Steelheart, Um, forgetting the dude's name, like they've known each other forever back in the Connecticut music scene, and Tommy wanted to do his own thing. But he calls me up and says, hey, uh, I got tickets to go see Bon Jovi and Skid Row. Hey, do you want to go? Absolutely. Totally, that's awesome, right? Because at this point, I wasn't sure. Like, they, they... we're maybe going to get married kind of thing. Anyway, so we go and Tommy's a party boy and we don't get there for Skid Row. Miss him completely. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. It's fine. Bon Jovi's a huge band. That's, yeah, that's what we're here to see. And 
we get through half of the set and he's coming back and forth, going to grab a beer, coming back and forth, coming back and forth, coming back and forth. So I'm watching a lot of the concert by myself. That's fine. That's fine. I'm at this point, uh, yeah, I'm 15. Um, oh, I don't know what time of year though. So 14, 15 years old, but he's just disappearing, come back. So then he comes up and he goes, Hey, we got to go. I'm like, what do you mean? We got to go. Why do we got to go? Tommy, why do we got to go? Uh, I kind of got to a fight, but it's not done unless we go. So we got to go. So he got into a fight probably skedaddled and made a a, a retreat. And I can imagine his retreat being somewhat of a uh, Captain Jack Sparrow kind of retreat, honestly. Like, think that energy, that vibe. And we hit the skids before, I think we were, they were closing out the set, getting ready for encore. So all the big songs were not yet played. A couple of them, obviously, because they have a huge catalog. But yeah, yep, this was um, New Jersey album I believe and yeah just missed all the biggest of hits no living on a prayer really just went to see Bon Jovi in 89 and I don't get to see living on a prayer and I don't get to see Skid Row um and yeah yep what a bummer so the next one so I went back and forth because I knew I saw (coughs) This opening act, I'm like, did I see them as as openers both times? And yes, I never saw them headline. But December 8th, 1989, at the Hartford Civic Center, we had the mighty Motley crew in support was Warrant. And Warrant, of course, at this time was coming off of Heaven, which was a number two hit. Um, they were quickly becoming my favorite of the hair bands because of Janie Lane's vocal performance, honestly, one of the greatest singer songwriters of, of the genre in particular, but I think overlooked because of the genre and songs like cherry pie for what was often, I think, exceptionally well-written stuff. And I think that when they kind of tried to change their sound, be a little grungier, a little more serious, I think his lyrics actually became a little bit more trite where he's trying too hard. Whereas all the stuff that he was doing in Warrant, great songwriting within the context of this hair band stuff, um, I think was much, much better. Um, but I mean, this was Motley Crue, Dr. Feel Good, clean, sober, lean, mean, fighting, like, let's go. <coughs> now, don't get me wrong. Warrant was very, very good. Held the crowd. Everyone was into it. But this was like the best that Motley Crue, I think, ever has been. They were just a force of nature. Absolute destruction from Tommy Lee. So this is when Tommy was was climbing up to like the trapeze for the drum solo when they were in, you know, indoor venues, um, just killing it. Vince was in fine, fine voice at this time. So, I mean, Vince back then, you have to think about it. He has a pretty high range and he could hit everything. And yeah, they did not let up, like no foot off the gas. Whole band, really a kick-ass show. Really strong. I mean, Warrant could not keep up. So, I mean, this is the difference between Poison kind of overshadowing David Lee Roth Warrant was good. Crew was killer. So then June 10th, 1990, a place that will be often on the list, and I believe they're running concerts again, and this is the location of my 40th, it was a surprise 40th birthday party, and this is Lake Compounds in Bristol, Connecticut, June 10th, Poison and Tesla. Now, the next concert, I just want to say, says June 30th, 1990 at Lake Compounds, Motley Crue and Tesla. I think one of those opening bands is wrong. I just can't place who played with who at that time. But I know that I saw both Poison and Motley Crue in 90 at Lake Compounds. I just don't believe it was Tesla 
opening in both. So I think that somewhere the archive is mixed up and my memory just can't get there. Um, but regardless, Tesla, a very, very good band. Poison in 90 and open up and say, ah, headlining and Motley Crue still on the feel good tour. Nobody's touching that. Like, you don't understand how good these bands were in 1990. Now you think about it, both Poison and Crew, like Crew came out early 80s, really hit it big. I want to say 84. Um, I want to say what, 80, what, 85 maybe was Theater of Pain, 86. I mean, Girls, Girls, Girls came not too long after. Um, I mean, both of those bands were making the play for like best live act. And they weren't competing even just with each other, but like the other stuff that was happening at the time. Let's see, in 90, around that time, the Stones were on tour, I think, with that Steelers Wheel tour, or that's somewhere in that time period. Um, they were competing with everyone. For you want to spend your money to go see a concert, you come see Poison, you come see Motley Crue, and you'll have your socks blown off. So, and Lake Compounds is an outdoor venue. So the way that it works, and it's like many of the places now where you have these outdoor amphitheaters where, <laughs> excuse me, you do have a um, an intersection, which is basically seated, but this was not at an angle like an amphitheater. This is just like an outdoor stage with like seating, not angled in a theater style. And then you had your general admission or walk-in standing room out in the back. Um, yeah, I mean, this was such a fun place because you also got a park ticket. So you can go ride some roller coasters and then you head down, get something to eat, hit the merch stand, and then go see a kick-ass concert. I mean, perfect place on a summer night to go see a concert. I mean, to be a teenager at this time, I mean, so good. So the next concert, also Lake Compounds, September 23rd, 1990. Now, this was so interesting because the bill itself didn't make sense on, on its face, but it was one of my favorite concerts and one of my favorite bands of all time. My number one favorite band of all time was the opening act. This was Billy Idol and Faith No More. Now, I'm sure this is a matter that Billy Idol is like, these guys are great. I don't really have a Billy Idol impression. Just like that was like generic, like Brit guy. That could have been Adam Ant or Billy Idol. Let's take these guys on the road, eh? Yeah, that'd be a good opener, eh? Yeah, well, yeah it's a good band, isn't it? Um, but Faith and More, they're like, hey, we're, it was like, it was professional. What I mean professional is, we're not the headliner. We're going to give you a hell of a show, but never to the limit. Like we're looking to upstage. We're just doing our thing. And it's different than what Billy Idol does, right? This is when, you know, Mike Patton at the time was doing the Nestle theme song. Nestle makes the very best. N-E-S-T-L-E-S. He sang that as a, as a ballad. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. All the girls were swooning. It's the fucking Nestle's theme song. But they they were ready to rock. Now, I did not see them again till many, many years later. So when I'm looking at stuff like 91, um, I didn't see them again until after the dates that are on here. Kicked ass. But then surprisingly, Billy Idol had a hell of a show. Steve Stevens was still playing guitar at the time. I mean, just this big, he had inflatables and background singers. It was a great professional rock show. And when I say professional, I've said it for both bands, but in different ways. Like Faith and More were, were pushing the limits without upstaging the headliner. And Billy Idol was delivering a polished performance that is born of being a headliner at this point for over a decade, right? Different energy 
than like your poisons and your motley crews who who are seemingly going out there to prove something to the world, right? Billy Idol is like, I don't have anything to prove. I could drop a single every couple of years. I'll get a top 10, do a tour, and then go back in my merry way. So it was like professional, well-executed, well-performed. It was a good show, a lot of fun. To me, Faith and More is obviously the highlight, but I can't say that Billy Idol wasn't good because he was. And this was like, you know, uh, Rock the Cradle Love era. Great show. So October 27th, 1990s, the first and only time I saw this band. And I don't remember seeing the opener opener. I'm sure that we did, but the New Haven Coliseum with Kiss, no makeup Kiss, Hot in the Shade Kiss, still great, Winger and Slaughter. I don't remember both Winger and Slaughter being on the bill. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I do remember seeing Winger. And they are by far the best musicians of that era that that are labeled with hair bands. Winger could just, the whole band, could outplay just about anybody. You know, Rod Morgenstein on the drums, you know, coming from the Dixie Dregs, a completely different kind of background. Um, Kip Winger, uh, songwriter, singer, bass player, had been with Alice Cooper. He also ballet dancer. Looks good, sounds good, ridiculous riches of talent for that guy. Um, oh gosh, uh, Reb Beach on guitar and then Paul Taylor on guitar and keyboards. Just strong, strong performers. But then there's Kiss. So I think that we had to leave because I didn't have a car then. And my stepdad and my mom decided to make it like a date. There's not a ton of places to go in New Haven. They probably went to, to Pepe's or whatever. And um, like, hey, got to get you. Like, you got to call at a certain time because you didn't have cell phones then. Um, and I don't think we saw the last. Gosh, did we miss rock and roll all night? I forget. I feel like we didn't get to the end of the concert. Maybe we did. But kiss with makeup, without makeup. You have to understand in 90, Paul Stanley from a vocal and performance perspective was also at his very, very best. He said he never sang better than during this era. And let's see, uh, it was Bruce Kulik on guitar, their best guitar player. Some might want to say, you know, ace for just being ace, but technically Bruce could do the ace stuff. He could do the Vinny stuff. He could do the March St. John stuff, but Bruce, kick ass guitar player and it was uh, Eric Singer on drums. Um yeah, it was a good show. They were doing a much more stripped down stage set for this tour if I remember. I do think they had a a, a Sphinx in the background like the um the the album. But I mean, Paul Stanley he was doing a lot of the lead vocal at the time, or at least that were a lot of the songs that were the hits. Not that Gene wasn't getting in there and, and singing when appropriate. Um, you know, obviously he has big numbers like Rock and Roll Night or um, um, I Like It Loud. Like he has a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, it was a good freaking show. But the only time I've ever seen Kiss was Hot in the Shade Tour. It's weird. It was weird. But I got it on the bucket list, if you will, of these legendary bands that, you know, according to them, they're done. They're done playing at this point. Of course, they've said that a number of times. And I guess you can go see them as holograms in Las Vegas. November 24th, also at the New Haven Coliseum. Poison once again, this time with Warrant in support. Now, this is now, I believe, Cherry Pie Warrant. Uh, a much more confident arena act. And I heard through the grapevine, heard uh hit parader or Krang magazine that there was some resentment happening on this tour between poison and warrant, even though they go back obviously many years on the sunset strip because of how good warrant had gotten. Now poison was probably in the throes of some addiction and some challenges at this point. Um, CC's proclivities for cocaine, for example, Warrant made a go of it in 90 as far as we're here to 
stake our claim. Such a different band than the one that opened up for Motley Crue. Like, so much better. And owned the stage. Owned the stage in a way that they couldn't before. Now, Poison came out, and they're doing a Poison show, which is amazing. But it was much more even between headliner and opener at this particular going. Now, I've never seen Warrant as a headlining act. Now, part of that is we'll we'll get down to 1991, um, because there was a tour that has gone down in illustrious, like in infamy, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Beers, which was Warrant, a firehouse, and a barely legal trickster that was considered one of the most debaucherous and fun tours. But I never saw Warrant as headliners. But yeah, at that time, Poison and Warrant, they were really running hard, neck and neck, as far as like the performance of the night. Now, the next one was not a concert that I was throwing down my hard-earned money for. Rather, friend of the show, Nicole, her little sister wanted to go see a concert. And I think she did a little bit too. So March 14th, 1991, at the Palace Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. I think the Palace. Is Palace New Haven? Um... Where's that Hartford? Um, yes, the Palace Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, so here's a weird one. Okay. Nelson. Yes, that Nelson. I just can't live without your love and affection, Ricky Nelson's boys, uh, Gunner and, oh my gosh, Gunner and Matthew. Oh, Matt and Gunnar Nelson. Matt Gunnar. Okay. Um, Matt and Gunnar Nelson. um, And House of Lords. Now, House of Lords, I think, are most popular for, was it a traffic cover? Um, I think it's traffic. Um, Hold on, hold on. Blind Faith, my bad, my bad. Blind Faith, Steve Winwood, because Steve Winwood was in traffic. Um, yes, can't find my way home. So House of Lords, best known for their cover. Um, but Nelson, interestingly enough, does have a connection to kind of the lineage of of Kiss through Vinnie Vincent, because uh, Bobby Rock was the drummer for Nelson, and he had been the drummer for the Vinnie Vincent invasion, which, of course, the Vinnie and Vincent invasion begat Slaughter because Dana Strum and Mark Slaughter were also part of Vinnie Vincent invasion. <laughs> but even more interesting is that the original singer for the Vinnie Vincent invasion, oh, what is his name? Because he was the original, Robert Fleischman, something Fleischman, was the original lead singer of Journey. So there's a little nugget for you for those who who don't know some of this random rock history. Oh my gosh, I got to look up his name now. This was, uh, these are things that are coming to me as I'm talking about it. I prepared all the dates, but then I start talking and go, oh yeah. Let's see, Robert Fleischman. Oh, bro, sometimes your brain works. Oh, so anyway, Nelson, House of Lords. It was a show in a theater. They were good. Two very big, Long-haired, blue-eyed, blonde, wow. Heartthrobs, Gunner, and Matthew Nelson. Just can't live without your love and affection, bro. So now, June 7th, 1991. Now, these two dates, June and July of 1991, I think that the archives are incorrect and that the opening acts are off by one or two because, oddly enough... If I take all these archives, I don't remember seeing Slaughter twice, which according to this, I did. But I definitely saw Bullet Boys. So I think Bullet Boys were in the second show I'm going to mention and not. Okay. Anyway, 
1991, June 7th, Poison, Slaughter, and Bullet Boys. Now, again, Poison ruling all ass, like uh, death but all, all but metal, um, Slaughter, and Bullet Boys. Bullet Boys were excellent, were excellent. And the reason I know I saw Bullet Boys in either one of these two concerts I'm going to mention, because I remember Mick Sweet is real weird, like, because nobody had, like, nipple piercings then, and he did. And he kind of looked like Slash, but, like, kind of more jacked. And Mark Torian is, like, this weird, like, uh, second coming of, like, David Lee Roth. But he had these, like, R&B pipes. And then it turns out he was actually a killer guitar player who was the original guitar player for Rat. But anyway, Poison Slaughter, Bullet Boys. The next concert I'm going to mention, which was I went and saw David Lee Roth again. David Lee Roth, Cinderella, and it says, it says Extreme. I don't remember seeing Extreme. I thought it was David Lee Roth, Cinderella, and Bullet Boys. But, ah, foggy. Very foggy. Long time ago. Don't really remember fully. But, um, yeah, it was a great time. It was a great time. Actually, hold on a second. Yes, I know. I'm not supposed to. Do I have a brain cramp? Yeah, no, okay. I have my timelines correct. Never mind. Thought I said something earlier that I was going to correct. Um, but Cinderella, um, really good. Really good live band. Um, yeah, I mean, David Lee Roth was such a showman that he, he made up for a lot, which is like the dancing and just the over-the-top stuff. But you could definitely see for Dave there was kind of a sea change. Um, but Cinderella was just so solid. You know, Tom Kiefer is a really phenomenal guitar player and a great songwriter, too. And I think a lot of it gets lost because of his vocal quality being much more akin to a, you know, a Brian Johnson of ACDC kind of thing, even though he, I think, has better range because uh, he could do some of the lower, lower stuff, lower register stuff uh, really well. As, yeah, yeah, it was a solid show. I just really don't remember seeing Extreme. I really don't. And the person that I would have gone to the show with probably, if I'm thinking, uh, no, July of 91? No. So maybe this was with Carlos. I should ask him. I should ask him because I'm trying to remember who I went with, but yeah, I thought it was a great show. It was it was fun in Cinderella. Like I said, that's the one that's memorable for me. And then the last concert that I'm going to I'm going to mention tonight, which is slightly different than the rest, if only because the the headlining band certainly sometimes shared the look of the hair metal bands or the, the glam aspects of it were not of the same genre of metal, if you will. So July 31st, 1991 at the Hartford Civic Center, Queenstrike selling out an arena with suicidal tendencies in support. What a weird show. What an absolutely weird show. Suicidal came out, boom, kicks some ass, in and out, probably 20 minutes. And then Queenstrike just played. Like, they played all of Mind Crime, but Empire was out at this time. So they got your Jet City women, Jet City Woman and, and Silent Lucidity. It was a whole stage show and performance. Jeff Tate's out there shooting baskets. Like, it was phenomenally good. And his vo vocals at that time unmatched, unmatched. He's why I took vocal lessons. Like, unfricking believable They were tight while they're actually performing, like really performing. And these guys, they, they know their math. Let's put it that way. What a great show. But this is where it's that Empire record from Queenstrike. Yes, it was considered like a prog metal, but like a song like Silent Lucidity, for example. But even Jet City Woman, it was almost timeless in its quality and how it was written, how it was performed, right? And it was this fall of 1991 
that a whole bunch of records that I've talked about on the podcast before came out. Your Sound Gardens, your Pearl Jams, your Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex Magic, Nirvana broke at this time, Metallica's Black Album, like, excuse me, the sea change in music happened in 1991. And I will be the first to admit, it's not that I stopped listening to the hair metal bands. I still listen to the hair metal bands. But they were quickly from like, I'm going to go see a live show. You want to go see Lollapalooza. You want to go see, by the way, very quickly, in this time frame, okay, I never went and saw Ozzy. And Ozzy always had the best support acts, by the way. He had Metallica on Master of Puppets. Now, my personal favorite Metallica album is Injustice for All, which was 80, 88, right? That's like 88. Yeah, because Justice was 86. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, guys. Um, So I didn't see Metallica on Justice, and I kept racking my brain going, is the first time I saw Metallica Black Album. It was. Because they started headlining on Justice, and I really, I don't think I saw them on Justice. So any of the friends from back in the day, if because I went and saw Metallica a number of times, I don't think it was Justice. But, Anthrax opened for Ozzy, but then like in 90 or 91, somewhere around there, Anthrax did this tour with um, Public Enemy and like, I think like Beastie Boys at one point, Um, I think Helmet might have been on that bill, like they did a bunch of really cool shows and I didn't see them at this time. I didn't, you know, see a bunch of stuff that I look back on and I wish I had. Um, there was like a monsters, a rock kind of tour thing that happened. Didn't see that. And I never went and saw Van Halen, which it was Van Hagar. And that's my mistake. That's on me. But music changed in late 91. So the fall of 91 was really the fall of all these bands going from selling out massive arenas to eventually going completely out, out of out of vogue and going into small theaters. And it took some of them years to get back to playing larger scale venues. Now, I think a lot of them, instead of doing a like NBA, NF, uh, NHL facility for like a basketball hockey place, they're doing like a like independent league or minor league hockey, minor league basketball. So it's a little bit smaller arena size, but it's still an arena and it still fits thousands of people. And so many bands are playing that size venue now. But think about this. So just I'll, I'll recap the headliners. Whitesnake, David Lee Roth, Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, Poison, Billy Idol, Kiss. Um, I mean, Nelson. But then again, Poison, David Lee Roth, Queenstrike. <clears throat> These bands were all multi-platinum sellers. Multi, multi-platinum sellers. And they were all number one records, even if they didn't have number one hits. And there was such an appetite to go see these shows. By the way, oh yeah, Guns N' Roses. I didn't see them on Appetite. I only saw them come Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. Um, That would have been a band to see on Appetite. Holy cow, that would have been brutal. They were on fire. But yeah, these guys were all in their 20s with platinum records at a time where I would say that, um, yeah, the times were just very, very different from what they are today. But the one thing that I take out of all of it is that guitar-oriented music was the thing. These guys all played their own instruments, wrote their own songs. Now, sometimes there was magic in the studio. Of course there was. I think of a band like Warrant that had, you know, Bo Hill on uh, producing it, and he added all these keyboards and fluff that you didn't need. It, it happens. By the way, I was supposed to go to see uh, Rat, White Lion, and Striper. Striper, my favorite of all the hair bands, at uh, a mid-sized place, maybe the Palace Theater 
and the concert got canceled. So I never got to see them. Um, Because Rat had started out being one of the bands that was in the arenas, taking out bands like Poison in support. Anyway, tell me, how many of these concerts and tours did you see? And are there any concerts or tours from bands that were in there that you went and saw that I hadn't even mentioned? I never went and saw a band like Kix play. Kix would have been amazing. I never saw any show opened up by bands like Danger Danger or Taiketo or Enough's Enough. Um, so many other tours that I'm sure were happening that maybe just didn't come my way or weren't on my radar for whatever reason. I mean, I never went and saw Aerosmith either. And I know a lot of people would love to go see Aerosmith and just nothing I've never, they've never been in my, my top, never been in my top list. So anyway, yeah, let me know either in the comments or you can go ahead and let me know other ways such as you can email me at stuckinmiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, X, and YouTube at StuckPodX. Head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle of Gen X Podcast. Please like, comment, share, leave five-star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later, slackers.